We're here to talk to you today about transforming the culture of two very, very different um, IT departments in two different universities, but we both had the same problem. So we've come together today to share our learning of actually changing the culture of our IT services departments, changing this culture of the staff. Um, we were ably helped to do this, and the link between the two universities is that Fiona and Anderson from Value in You um, assisted both of us in actually on the journeys um, that we started. And it is a journey because we are still on that journey and we still have staff who still believe in the old ways and we're changing their culture as we, as we move along. So I'm going to kick off first of all and tell you from the Queen Mary perspective the challenges that we faced and also the, um, the, road, the journey that we went on and how we achieved it. So a little bit about Queen Mary first of all. Well, quite a good link to the Olympic talk we had by Jerry is that um, the Olympics were one stop on the central line from Queen Mary University. We're based in the east end of London, um, between, strategically placed between the city and Docklands. We're the only campus university in London. We've got over 2,000 student beds on site, so that's a big selling point for the university. We've got about 18,000 students and um, around 4,000 staff. We're a member of the Russell Group. We've recently joined the Russell Group, and we're a research-led um, institution. So that's enough about us um, and about the background. Let's move on to what we actually have to do. I was taken on at the university because IT services were viewed by our customers as failing. The department itself grew out of research. I had some very, very clever people working for me when I arrived there. All of the lead team were PhDs and had been working at the university for over 35 years. They're all in their early 60s. They invented IT, and that's what they felt. So if I asked them a question such as mentioned industry best standard, they would say to me, Chris, stop. We set industry best standard. And you don't understand. We define it. And as we'll see, they didn't really understand, because they've been there so long, how industry had moved, industry had moved around them. So I had to define an IT strategy and win a mandate from the top table of the table of the, of the university. And the university backed me by defining the mandate that we could actually centralize IT. I only had 60 people working for me then, but around the university there was about 180 working in IT. There were 44 server rooms around the college, nine email systems, every single type of virtualization you can imagine, and it was all done differently. And the poor student and researcher was stuck in the middle of this. So I was given the mandate that I could centralize it. And that was a big thing for a research-led university to come up with that mandate that we're going to impose on the university. They gave me a major pot of money to go out and do this piece of work with, uh, which was good. And they also understood it wasn't a cost-saving exercise. So centralization wasn't about getting rid of jobs. In actual fact, we were going to increase in size. It was about improving the service. I was given six months to plan it and four years actually to execute it. But what hit me straight away was the technology, the tin, is our bread and butter. We can deliver that. We can deliver projects that can put new data centers in, that can bring in new applications. The real tough job was changing the culture of the staff and getting them to understand exactly what we were there to do. What did our customers think of us? We went out and asked them. And they said, I see services can't do it, won't do it, so we'll have to do it ourselves. 44 server cupboards around the college. They said, we don't have the basic tools to do our job. I've come from a university X and they had this, they had the other. We just don't have that here. And the students just couldn't understand where we were coming from at all. They said, we were stuck in a time warp. Everything we were doing was 15 years out of date. If they asked for something from IT services, it just disappeared into a black hole. We never actually delivered it. 
Not worth complaining about it. Nothing ever happens. So let's just do it ourselves. The medical school, which makes up over half of the university in income-wise, actually was talking about outsourcing the whole of IT and declaring UDI right from the outset. That's what our customers thought. Compare that with what our staff thought when we asked them. We don't have customers, they said. Another member of staff said to me, Chris, I came here to do research. I had a very frank conversation and said, there's a computer science department over there that does research. What we do is deliver a service. We're an enabler to the university, and we're a service delivery organization. No, no, no. I came to work here to do research. That was what they felt. Another one said to me, when can you do this by? Chris, you don't understand. We don't do deadlines. You get it when we're ready. Um, we lead best practice. It was another comment. Um, the, 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 all of the staff come out and saying, you know, staff priorities and agendas were just out of control. There was no performance management. Staff turned up when they want, went home when they want, didn't have a list of tasks, didn't have objectives, and there was certainly no collaboration even between teams within the IT department. Hence, within the fifth, the core IT department, we had three email systems we supported because each team thought they should do it differently. It was just a crazy situation we were in. So how did we go about actually changing it? Well, we got Fiona in for a start to help us. And I had to engage with this right at the very, very beginning. And I could start this from day one. Even when we started defining the strategy, doing the planning, I started on changing the culture. And the first thing we did, I got all the staff together in a room, got the principal in, who was a new principal at the time, to actually define what he expected from IT services. And sitting in that room, everybody was like this. Arms crossed, just looking at us and um, saying, this is not for me. We told them what the customer was saying about them. That's not us. No, that's not us. We told them that um, the medical school was starting to think about outsourcing. Somebody put their hand up and said, Chris, let them. We don't care. Why do we want the medical school? So in response, I got every other person to stand up. And I said, right, sorry, you're all redundant now. Walk out the door. And they were totally shocked. And I said, well, the medical school pays half of the money to keep this department running. Do we have customers? Stunned silence. I said, I think you agree we do have customers. But without them paying us, they can go and pay for anybody to do this job. You haven't got a job. It's as simple as that. We introduced the concept of the elephant in the room. And we said, we're going to work with you. We're going to talk to you. We want everybody to comment on and feel free that they can talk and input into the way we're going to be doing things in the future. And we'll make this change happen together. Because without it, guys, none of us have got a job. I haven't got a job either. We've got to change. So we had to really get over to them that they're not a research department. We had to get over to them that they're a service provider and customers exist. How did we do that? What were the key enablers? We introduced things like one-to-ones with clear objectives and targets for them to follow. So they actually had a structure to what they were delivering and they were accountable for what they were delivering. We introduced those one-to-ones one -ones by saying, actually, it's to help you because when you get stuck and you say, I can't deliver something, I am your manager and it's there to help you unblock that. We introduced personal development plans for everyone and appraisals, never had them before. So they actually felt we were caring about them and starting to develop them as individuals. We got them involved in developing a logo for the department around workshops and tables like this and a mission statement. What are we here to do? What encapsulates what we do? And they came up that we work in partnership to deliver a valued and effective um, IT. They come up with the logo at the bottom here. We started saying words like we plan it, we supply it, we support it. 
They started seeing what we were actually there to do, what our role is. We had regular monthly workshops when we gradually took them on a journey of actually saying, you step into the customer's shoes. You're at home now and the internet goes down. What would you expect your internet provider to provide you with? Now, do you provide our customers with that level of service? No. And gradually, in convincing them and getting embedded in their minds that the, the culture of service as opposed to the culture of technology and doing research started changing radically the way the service was being delivered. What change did it make? And how did we measure that change? Well, this was an eye-opener. We did a survey of staff when we started, and we did the same survey about eight or nine months in. And there's some stunning results here. Results like providing and demonstrating leadership went up by 64 percentage points in what they thought of the department. I've received sufficient training to do my job went up 25%. Deals with poor performance and effectiveness. They actually didn't like it that there were people there sitting doing nothing. They actually felt, you know, well, look at them sitting over there doing nothing all the time. Nobody ever does anything about it. That went up 47% that we actually started dealing with that. So we were quite shocked at these results and very pleased. And it really demonstrated that we actually took the staff on that journey with us. Because eight months in, this is the kind of results we were getting. Another interesting one, a session that Fiona ran, was it about a year in, it was Christmas time, and she ran a workshop with all the staff, post-it notes around the wall, brown paper. What we want you to do is think about what was good we've done over the year and what wasn't so good. Believe it or not, it took me six months to get one-to-ones in. Unions involved, you can't do this. A year on, the number one thing they said that improved their lives was one-to-ones. And that was a revolution, I thought, that from actually saying at the beginning and getting unions involved, you're not, you know, we just can't do this. A year on, the result was the best thing that's happened to us in the last year is we now do one-to-ones. We know what we're meant to be doing for a job. If we get stuck, our managers support us. Our managers train us. I, have, I can see where I'm going. And from that, the whole culture of the department started to change. They now recognise we have customers. They now recognise that we're not just a technology department to do research. We've, inter we've used a couple of tools and a couple of standards to help us on the way. A couple of frameworks. We used IIP because that had all the right things, like one-to-ones, PDPs. All that framework was there, so we just picked it up and used it and we implemented um, IIP. We achieved IIP accreditation in 11 months. And I think that's testament to the, the, the start of the journey they went on and, and how they got there. We also put ISIL in to bring in things like change management, risk, um, risk management, Incident and re release management, request management, all the good item tools we've put in place as well. But the focus all the way along has been there's a customer at the end of this. And you know, guys, they don't have to buy the service off of us. They can go anywhere to buy this service. So that's the journey that Queen Mary went on. I'm now going to hand over to Ragu from London Met, who went on a very similar journey, approached it in a slightly different way, and he'll tell you what they did. Thanks, Chris. As you click over here. Um, I think as Chris mentioned, London Met went on a very similar journey, but we had a couple of constraints. One was our primary driver was being cost effective. So while we were given quite a bit of money, around 15 million, to transform IT, our underpinning driver was within five years, you need to significantly reduce the cost while increasing efficiencies. Uh, there you go. I'm not going to go through my slides at the moment. I'm just going to sort of talk for a while before we sort of go back to the slides. 
The IT transformation program, which we started off in around 2009, when we started that, London Met basically had two IT departments. So we had, even though there's one department, they were actually operating as two. So we had two different cultures, two different processes, two different technologies. By 2012, when we finished what we thought was the major part of the culture transformation program, we could see the benefits internally. So we could say, hang on, most of our technology is totally modernized. We are on par of the sector. All our tier one systems were up all, around 99.9%. .9%. Our benchmark costs were almost 1.5 million lower than the our competitor costs. Plus our staff base had reduced from almost 180 to 100 plus, which we all felt was a significant achievement. But the problem was when we started speaking to our stakeholder group and speaking to our customers, the feedback was IT is still not fit for value. IT does not deliver what we want. And it's, it's almost like they did not or would not see the changes which we had delivered. And that then meant our staff didn't feel very valued by our customers. Just to make sure that this is not an internal perception, we had an external uh, body come in and do a review. And what they said was, actually, in three years, you moved from being substandard into being a functional department. This led to quite a bit of soul searching within the university exec. And they finally signed off on what we called as a culture transformation program. Luckily, because I had almost a three-year run where we cleaned up IT, and I started to look at what do I need to do, I came across Chris, and that's how we started working together on the cultural transformation side of things with Fiona and Chris on this one. So once the entire program got signed off, we, all, we followed a reasonably similar path to Queen Mary's in the fact that rather than me standing up here and saying to my staff, look, you need to change, I had Chris present talk about their journey so they, they could feel that it is not something which they were going to go through on their own. We then had our deputy chief executive stand up and talk about the need for behavioral changes. We then agreed with them what we we're going to be doing. So we sort of agreed, hang on, we can't try to impose anything onto a set, set of almost 100 plus people who are pretty specialized. So we sort of set, stepped back and we agreed on the following things. We said, the key thing around this is going to be customer experience. We need to make sure that we set the expectation right. We need to make sure that we talk the same language. And when I mean language, it's not English, but it's about making sure when both parties meet and leave, they have the same understanding of what is expected, have the same common understanding. And Chris stole my thunder on this one, walk in the shoes of the customers. But it's the same thing. Uh, it kicked off in around Jan 2013. So what, what you're going to see is I'm going to skim over quite a few slides because I don't want to keep you here more than you want to. That's it. So what you're going to see here is when we started, and if you ignore all the bits around achievements and our aspiration, the perception of our customers was basically we were not responding and resol resolving issues proactively. The big issue was around communication. I mean, I think no matter how many times you talk about communication, I think my thumb rule now is if I think I need to do 10, I'm going to aim for 20. Uh, they ha we have single, several single points of failure. Given our cost drivers, it's almost inevitable. I don't think we have a choice other than to have single points of failure given the amount we support. I mean, we are, just like Queen Mary's, we're a large central department. But it's about how do we make sure we mitigate that risk it's about making sure that the customers felt listened to. I mean, the, uh, the biggest problem we faced was our customers would come in and say, I want to do this in this particular tool set, and I want this done like this. And so this is about making sure that they felt listened to, but not doing what they asked for. And uh, it might not have come out the right way. Right? When I say not doing what they asked for, it is doing making sure we do it in using the same common architectures, but making them understand why we're doing that. The good news was they accepted that IT was doing a very difficult job in very trying circumstances and had made significant improvements. The key point here is if you then look at the IT staff perception, internally they felt very proud to work with an ISS. 
around almost 90% of them. But only a third felt valued by the university. And that's where the entire disconnect was. So the journey we then took was, rather than making it into a, a management initiative, in a way, this became more like a collaboration. It, I think they nowadays use the word dem democratic leadership. So it, 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 we sort of worked with them closely. So we started having almost till recently, we are having four-week all-staff workshops, not meetings, where they would work with us on particular issues and scenarios. We had uh, what we call as a CSC staff group, and that group was supposed to be the champions from bottom up. So it was not seen as top-down. They were supposed to lead with what we expect to be our vision, what we expect to be our aspiration, and you will see the staff line in the bottom there. I'm not saying we do it currently, but this is what we aspire to. Uh, this is around our values. This is around our behaviors. They then agreed with us what the priorities were. So my job, in effect, was just to be the facilitator, nothing else. These were the priorities that the staff felt was essential. We decided we were going to stick with ITIL as the framework within which we were going to develop the common language with our customers so that they knew when we said a service instant what it meant, when we said a problem what did it mean, when, it, when we said a request what it meant. We then focus on communications. I mean, this is one area where I'm, I think we've made significant progress, but every time I think we've done enough, we always learn a lesson that it's not. So we have a comms officer now. We have an internal IT newsletter that goes out every two weeks. We have six weekly staff workshops. Uh, we're starting to have an IT website that's current. We're starting to talk to our stakeholders and publish what the requirements are. We started then investing in people. I think uh, when we started, uh, the amount of investment in staff was almost peanuts. So we're now spending a significant sum of money on training them so they know that they're being valued. And the, the last two basically comes down to staff wanting to feel engaged. So we let them agree on a set of values and behaviors. I mean, there, there are no posters in all key ISS offices and including the help desk, which talks about the power words. So the power words basically are reliable, flexible, valued, and proud. Based on them, what would be our behaviors? That then automatically led to the staff agreeing on what is not acceptable behavior. So this didn't need me standing there saying, you know, you should not come late, you should not be, you know, you should respond to a customer you know, in an optimum time, but they did it themselves. The last bit was an anomaly. I mean, I, I still struggle to correlate that particular requirement. They wanted to work with us on the technology strategy. They wanted to be part of the group that put together the strategy. I mean, everywhere else it's always been... Uh, it's something which you work with your execs and you know, it sort of comes down top down. So we're starting to do that. I'm not saying we're perfect in this, but we're trying our best to get there. So following are some of the tools which we used to sort of get them on the path of where we wanted them to go. Right? So what you're seeing here is to help them understand why they're behaving in a certain way, what their objectives are, why we're setting the appraisal the way we're doing. We're taking it back further up. So we're saying your customer service excellence program sort of sits in the middle. You have your team objectives that links back into the ISS vision, which they have worked with us on, the strategy, which they're sort of reviewing and signing off on, the balance scorecard and key performance indicators that links back to the university strategy, that links back to the NSC scores. We also introduced something called a WOW conversation. It was basically around making sure that people find uh, a non-formal framework to air concerns without it becoming a, you know, entrenched positions on both sides arguing with each other. So this is basically around three things. What happened, what outcome did you expect, and how do we agree a way forward? Very simple. Um, again, these things are works in progress. I, I'm never going to claim it's complete. I, I see this. We've been doing this for 12 months. I say this for another at least 18 months before I can say it get in reasonable shape. And just to show some statistics, <clears throat> as you can see, as of almost September or nine months, our staff satisfaction has gone up by almost a quarter. 
staff feel a lot more valued by around 60 percent and they feel you know they're valued within ISS it's gone up by at least another quarter I think some of you have noticed the last time it ended was in September and the reason why this is is as of October we went into a consultation trade unions that ended just recently so I suspect when I go back and do the survey again I would have slipped back learning from London Met uh, this was a very fascinating experience. I mean, I worked in Oracle for quite some time, and, and I used to think Oracle, working in Oracle was difficult, and I think this is the worst thing, the worst place I worked in. And when I say worst, I mean from the level of challenges that are thrown at you on, almost on a daily basis. My boss, who was the deputy chief executive, was the chief operating officer in NatWest. He, he echoes this. Every time, both of us sit there thinking, you know, we should, we should find this easy, but we're not. We find this really difficult to work, but not in a stressful way, but in a challenging way. One of our staff members actually uh, summarized this pretty well. He basically said, till now, I feel like a little boy standing outside the sweet shop with my nose pressed against the glass, looking at all the sweeties inside. Now that you brought me in, I have no clue what to do. Right? The Staff have an expectation, and this, this one took me a while to work out. Staff, staff have an expectation that change programs will happen. But what they don't realize is we have been doing it incrementally. They, we, they don't realize that from when we started, comms have significantly improved. They're having one-to-ones. They don't realize they have had appraisals. There's lots of procedures and frameworks where they are engaged in. And I think in this December, I, I, I ha my wife gave birth to our, our first child, and that's when it sort of hit me. When you see a little child and, you, and you're with it every day, you don't see it grow. It's somebody else from outside who sees it grow. And so now what we're doing is we're making it a point almost regularly when we have these all-staff workshops to say, that is what we said we're going to do. Look at what we have achieved so that they can see it and they can visualize the change and what they've gone through. Uh, I don't have to explain the background about London Met. I think all I can say is in London Met, the only constant is change. And because of that, we always expect this to be a journey where we go back three steps, no, go forward three steps and go back two. So it is going to be a very slow journey, and it's about making sure staff come along with us on that journey. I think at this point, I'm going to pause because you have two people very vested into us talking about what their organizations have done. And I think in, on, on the whole, we're sort of both of us telling it's been a pre very positive experience. So we're going to sort of get our external, Fiona. I mean, if you don't mind, Fiona, would you mind telling us about what your experiences have been? Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of time. Um, so I'm just going to put up a slide and just talk a couple of points to you. Um, the vision is absolutely fundamental and a vision that will last, a vision that will serve purpose in describing what it is you expect um, from everybody within the department. Absolutely fundamental. Very important you know your baseline. Culture change, how do you measure it? It's like jelly, it wobbles. Will you find your baseline in your first staff workshop based on the values from your vision statement? Leadership, oh my goodness, this is a really tough one for you. You have got to be consistent. You are those role models. You get measured for absolutely everything, and you have to be on, on message. I think we've heard about most of the other things. When it was centralization was involved from a Queen Mary perspective, the eye went off the ball in terms of recruitment. Oh boy, did we feel the pain. Yeah. Um, and when centralization was happening, we also felt the pain in that we weren't able to communicate directly with the staff that were coming into IS. Uh, and so that was a real challenge. So two, two really good learning points there. And you'll be pleased to know that grievances and complaints do um, reduce as a result of culture change. So a bit, little bit less pain for yourselves and more time to do your job. So I'd like to invite um, Raghu and Chris up um, for questions, I'm sure. You'd got some questions.
I give um, the response to that from both of them? They didn't have their staff um, customer feedback at the beginning. That was kind of put through the way, so I need to ask, um, certainly you're, you're measuring yours much more now, aren't you? Yeah, we're measuring our customer satisfaction now, and we're at 97% satisfaction, either, satis either meets expectations or exceeds, which is absolutely fantastic. We still get complaints, we're in IT. You know, if it goes wrong, it's our fault, isn't it? But um, in general, um, when we have help desk calls and we ask them at the end of each call, can you rate us, we get 97% satisfaction. And there's a completely different culture of the way we deal with customers now. It really has changed. And you've got student satisfaction data, yeah. I think we, we have student satisfaction data, and what we're starting to do is through our help desk system, we're starting to measure based on questionnaires. We didn't force them to do it, but there's a link, and there's also a snap poll which they can take. We just started this, I'm not going to claim, you know, we have a very good run of the statistics. But the good news, I think I'm starting with my phone here somewhere. The good news is our customers who were complaining before about us not delivering are now complaining about not giving them more. So sort of you can see the shift in the way the complaints are going. So rather than saying you're not adding value, they're not saying you're not doing things fast enough. So the question was about performance management. Was it limited to IT or, or university-wide? Our formal one-to-ones, the level we do them, um, introduce them, that they were documented. Um, I think that's pretty much unique to our department. Um, we didn't have any steer from the institution at all in actually bringing them in. Um, but, you know, what I said to the staff was you, we shouldn't have a performance issue really because if you're dealing with them every month rather than waiting for an annual appraisal, problems shouldn't happen anyway because you shouldn't nip them in the bud. And that's by and large what's happened. We still, but we do still obviously move people into formal performance management now. That was never done in the past. In fact, if anything, people were promoted for being underperforming before to get them out of the way and that was an easy way to move them on. That certainly doesn't happen now, and we do deal with underperformance by taking them through formal, if needed, formal procedures now. There was one more question there. The question was about ITIL and how much work was um, informing customers about the language we were using. I think I, I have the easiest answer to this. I mean, given that we just started the journey, uh, we're trying our best not to uh, go down a path where we start debating about the language because we, we did this with Prince too. And then we used to start having arguments about what Prince to stages meant with our customer and client because we trained them as well. So now it's, it's all about it's. I'm still beeping somewhere. Uh, it's, it's almost about making it in plain, simple language where they can understand, and the ITIL is rolled out with an ISS, and a customer doesn't see it. I think that applies to us as well. Um, we trained every member of IT staff. Every single member went on ITIL training. But um, as far as the customer is concerned, it's just good customer service. They don't understand what we're doing in the background, such words as release management and words like that. We do it but they don't know it goes on. So the language isn't an issue to them. One last question. I mean, the <coughs> Sean is here as well, and he can jump in if, he, if I've sort of gone off piste on this one. Behaviors, we have uh, the values and expectations, which is there. The wall conversations were supposed to help us reinforce good behaviors and working patterns. Uh, it worked pretty well till September, October, till when we went to trade union consultations, and then there is a reasonable dip in uh, expected behaviors. Not from my perspective, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, it was a journey that we're still on. I think we're good and I would both agree. It's, it never ends. But it's a journey where we've seen a big difference in the perspective of the customers and that we do step into the customer's shoes now. Um, I've been asked to close the session. The bar's open apparently in there. So um, let's go in there and have a drink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.